session, shall we say, wraps up the first day of the conference. And my name is Adam Toos, and it's been my great pleasure, along with Giancarlo, Mori, and Patricia, to be part of the organising committee for this conference on the anniversary of Keynes's economic consequences of the peace. Uh, none of it would have been possible without the extraordinary work of the organising team and the uh, administrative support that we've received. Or would the event have been possible without the generous sponsorship of a truly dramatic list of sponsors? First, I will mention the Swedish Rift Bank, the Bank of Italia and the Bank of England, Cambridge Branch of, the Marshall Library of Economics, King's College, SRI, and the CFM, the Centre for Macroeconomics. We're enormously grateful, and I'm sure everyone here is enormously grateful for their support for what has been a truly fascinating discussion. But it's my particular pleasure, I think, to introduce this panel and to chair the discussion this afternoon, because it brings together a really remarkable group of people on the table uh, alongside me here. In alphabetical order, starting on the right, we have Edward Carr, Deputy Editor of The Economist, responsible for the editorial. He joined The Economist as science correspondent in 1987. After a brief stint at the Financial Times, he returned to The Economist in 2005. And it was his brilliant essay. In what I have to say, I think is a purple patch in the history of The Economist. I, I don't, there's nothing I read with great pleasure right now in your journal. But in, amidst that purple patch, what really caught our eye was an essay, What If the Allies Had Been More Generous in 1919? Now, uh, and this turned into an extended discussion of Keynes's contribution to the debate. This was part of your counterfactual uh, supplement that you had. As you all know, in the, in the way of The Economist, these essays are anonymous, but if you have somebody of Maury Obsfeld's pull on your team, that veil of anonymity is quickly lifted. And we discovered that Edward Carr was the man behind this essay, and I'm enormously grateful to you for joining us. Next to Edward is nothing less than a, a legend, and it truly is a thrill to be sitting here beside Stanley Fisher, former vice chair of the, the Federal Reserve, uh, former governor of the Bank of Israel, former chief economist of the World Bank, Currently, advisor, senior advisor to BlackRock's Investment Institute, truly a legend of modern macroeconomics, and a really fitting contributor to a discussion about Keynes, because after all, Stanley Fisher is one of the key figures in the Keynesian counter revolution against the rational expectations push of the 1970s. His essay of 1977, which asserted and demonstrated the significance of monetary economic policy in affecting the output. Rational expectations notwithstanding, you insist, is a, is a foundational paper, so it's truly an honour to have Stanley with us today. Next to me on my left is Cecilia Kingsley of the Swedish Rick's Bank. Thank you so much for your support of our event and for your being willing to join us today. She had a distinguished career uh, as a journalist and banking economist after uh, graduating from the Stockholm School. So we have another one of the great strands of the broad church of Keynesianism with us on the panel today. And she is now a deputy governor at the Swedish Central Bank, one of the distinguished panel of economists that advise that institution. And it's interesting monetary policy course in the present moment. Thank you for joining us. And Cecilia, and my friend and colleague Jeff Mann of Simon Fraser University, professor in the Department of Geography, director of Simon Fraser Centre for Global Political Economy, author with Joel Rainwright, amongst other things, of a crucial intervention in the political economy and political theory of climate change, Climate Leviathan, a book which was preceded by what I think is in many respects the most interesting intervention in the interpretation of Keynes that has been published in recent decades, a truly pathbreaking book on thinking about Keynes as, as much a political theorist as a political economist, Jeff engages in the truly head-turning exercise of rethinking the history of political theory in Europe back to Hegel in terms laid out by Keynes. And it was striking, I think, today how people coming from very different vantage points in economic history and economics, indeed, converged on an understanding of Keynes as a theorist of the fragility of political economy opens the door to Jeff's interpretation. So I'm really excited by this panel, looking forward to the discussion. But first of all, please join me in, in uh, welcoming our... our We have, the, we have the luxury of an extraordinary amount of time for this panel. Not something the chair often gets to say, but we really could go on and on and on. But I, so I thought what we would do is start with a relatively loose format, which is simply to ask each one of the panellists to respond to the prompt. In other words, what they take the contemporary relevance of Keynes's 
beautiful masterpiece to be. And I thought maybe we would just simply start in, in order of, of the way people are arranged on the panel here. So Edward, if you want to give us the benefit of your take, and then what we'll do is we'll ping things back and forward a little bit from here. I know how eager people will be to get involved, and we have all the time in the world to allow that conversation to unfold. Thank you very much indeed. Well, one of the things I, I have to do for my sins is, is follow Boris Johnson's tweets. And um, <laughs> a few months uh, before he became Prime Minister, he tweeted that what do we have to think about but this Carthaginian process ahead of us in the EU? And I don't think he was referring to the Third Punic War. What he was referring to was, of course, Keynes and Versailles. And so it isn't just us here in this room who are thinking about what is the contemporary relevance of their side. It's on the minds of politicians too. Now, one thing that struck me is that towards the end of the economic consequences, Keynes writes, the forces of the 19th century have run their course and are exhausted. We must find a new way and must suffer again the malaise and finally the pangs of a new industrial birth. And you can't hear those words without thinking of Gramsci 11 years later, who said something very similar and very famous, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Now, I'm a journalist and not an academic or a central banker, so when I look at Keynes, I'm obviously interested in what is going on at the time, but I'm also interested in what lies this sheds on the present. And there are so many avenues we could choose from, and we've been exploring the summer of the conference this afternoon, the coordination uh, of global policy, the role of sanctions, deflation, the ebb and flow of globalization, the rise of Germany and China. But I want to draw your attention to the background to all of this, uh, which is that once again, I think, we're at a moment when the old order is dying. We're moving rapidly from an era of technocratic democracy to well, so something different. I don't know what it is. But the signs of that change are all around us. Donald Trump, the disintegration of central parties in France and Germany and here in Britain, the hollowing out of democracy in countries like Hungary, the rise of populists in Mexico and Brazil, the crisis of confidence in Western democracy, the supplanter of technocratic government with the politics of identity, a trade war between the US and China, the rise of China itself, uh, and its autocratic capitalism. So what does Keynes tell us about um, all of these phenomena? And I want to very, very quickly to, to make five points. The first is something that he shows us. Uh, in, in, in the technocratic paradigm, disputes are settled with data uh, and statistics. But in the moment of crisis, they're settled by rhetoric and language. And I don't want to get into the question of whether Keynes was right or wrong, but what is undeniable is that this book is a brilliant polemic. It's fantastically well written. Your eyes sort of skate over the tables of German railway deliveries. <laughs> I can't manage that. But what I do take in is the sweeping generalisations made with utter confidence. And they're bolstered by sort of fantastic and telling details. Of Clemenceau, he says he was thrown in his grey gloves on the brocade chair, dry in soul, empty of hope, very old and tired. <laughs> Keynes even notices the muscles on the back of Woodrow Wilson's neck. It's just, it's so lively, it's fantastic journalism. He, he establishes, through the way he uses language, a truth that whatever you or I might think about how accurate and how correct Keynes was, that truth lives on as Johnson's tweet attests. <laughs> Comparing 2019 to the interwar years, uh, I'm not trying to say that we're about to see fascism. I'm not saying that. There are similarities, but I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that the economic consequences are about five things. The power of rhetoric, the demonization of opponents, the marginalization of, economy, of economics, the, the zero-sum politics, and the taking for granted of European peace. And Keynes is a warning to us all. When the foundations begin to slide, much else slips along with it. Th thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And usually I go to conferences and I want to leave. This one I... <laughs> 
uh, actually, I'm very happy to be here because there's such a variety of backgrounds and elements of things I'd never thought of that I keep hearing. Uh, I'm very grateful to the people who put it on and the people who financed it for setting up this uh, conference. I was asked this morning by somebody, how, how did I learn Keynesian economics? Why am I a Keynesian? I think the theme was, how could somebody who came from uh, a small town in the middle of what my grandmother called the jungle, how could a guy like that have reached attendance at a conference uh, like this? Well, I was introduced to economics by a son of friends of my parents who had just come back from the LSE when I was fin just finishing high school. And I asked him, what did he do at the LSE? And he told me about economics, which was the first I'd heard about this idea. And I said, well, so how would I learn something about economics? So he took two books off his shelf. One was Samuelson's Economics, and the other was The General Theory. <laughs> and he said, you should read these two books. Well, I managed Samuelson's book. It was longer but you could read it more rapidly than you could read the general theory if you were trying to actually understand the general theory. <laughs> I didn't think I would learn to understand the general theory on a first reading, but I certainly enjoyed, the, for the first time, reading something that had been given to me as a textbook that actually was written extremely well, although when I read the literature, I understand it's turgid and this, that, and the other. I didn't find all that. I just found the, the uh, wonderful phrases that would crop up from time to time as making the whole thing much more interesting. I went to the LSE, and I heard references to Sayers today, to Richard Sayers, from whom I learned macro and money. It shocked me severely when he announced to the class one morning I was in Germany on the weekend and I visited Old Man Schatz. And I thought, you visited Hitler's banker? Am I supposed to keep talking to you? Am I supposed to keep listening to you? I had no idea about the continued existence of Hitler's banker. But I also liked Sayers, so I was in a bit of a tough spot. Eventually, I learned to live with people who knew both Schatz and Sayers. And I actually read what uh, Schatz had written. And I don't know how innocent or guilty he was, but he was interesting. On today's discussions, I just want to respond briefly to a few points that were made that I think I could contribute something small. There seemed to be some view today about if Keynes was systematically making money, he was probably breaking inside knowledge constraints. It's not true. I once sat at a dinner next to the partner of Buffett. You may ask how I got to sit next to the partner of Buffett. Well, it wasn't for my wealth that much, I can tell you. <laughs> but I told him I was from MIT, and he said, oh, he said, Paul Samuelson must be the richest economist who ever lived. I told Samuelson this, and he practically went through the ceiling. He said, he had no business describing my wealth to you. And I'm pretty... <laughs> I, I'm pretty horrified. <laughs> and he was right. I mean, the fact that you have a business relationship with someone doesn't give you the, the right to gossip about him. Anyway, the Thucydides trap takes off from a writing by Thucydides on the war between Athens and Sparta. And he says that when a new power is coming into a system, it frequently leads to war because the new power wants to take over the system. Well, what Allison did was, going back, I think, to the 14th or 15th century, he counted how many times in the international diplomatic field there were situations like this. And he came up with 16 over about four centuries. And of those 16, 
all but four led to war. I was sure until two years ago that that was not true of the way China had been handled by the George Bush and later administrations. I'm not sure now that China and the United States are working under an optimal arrangement that will produce peace. What is going on now would surely frighten Keynes and bring forth some of the wording that we can find in economic consequences of the peace. Because taking on a power which in some respects is showing more success than the existing hegemon is not a very wise thing to do. I am from day to day more and more concerned that the way that this is being treated by the United States government is not only not very positive, it's not positive at all, it's negative. That relationship has been worsening from day to day for a long time, and it's getting worse and worse. And I don't think it is consistent with the sort of philosophy of interstate relations that is explicit in the economic consequences of the peace. And I think of that very hard, but I'd like to take one, I'd just like to throw in one uh, question, big question. I asked myself, what would have happened if we had treated them well, they still would have wanted to ta overtake the United <coughs> States as the hegemon. Would that have happened? Would it have been stopped? I'm not sure. I just don't know what consequence there would be if we'd been more generous to the Chinese. We were certainly generous at the beginning and for a long time. To the extent that it became an issue in American politics, and it's clear what the voters who voted in Trump believed about what is happening with China. And it, most of it, it happened when they were being treated well, according to the rules that I think Keynes would have liked. So I don't know what the answer to that is. And I think it is a question as to whether we will find, even if we reverse course, that this is a situation that does not lead to conflict. Those happy thoughts. <laughs> Let me thank you for listening and thank you for inviting me to this event. Cecilia. So thank you very much also for being here. I can, I can say that my day job is spent with negative interest rates and unconventional monetary policies and and a bit of trying to assess the trade conflicts and what, what can be done or not be done in the shape or form of monetary policy. So it's, it's great to be here to get into another set of problems. It makes my life a bit more colorful. Unfortunately, I didn't stay very long at university. I took my degree and then I ventured out in life. So when I read the book, I have to say I read it more like a middle manager uh, because I spent many years as a middle manager. And I thought about the guys in the room, I thought about how would they perform in an annual development dialogue, the one you know have with a manager and, a, and the employee. And so I thought about it as a, as a serious example of a really bad management failure. <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't get any bonuses, I can tell you. <laughs> so let me, let me go through three very important guys in this drama that Taines uh, writes early early about. Let me sort of bring out what I think are the, are the lessons learned for our generation, where we are now in the early 21st century. Starting with Woodrow Wilson, a fantastic characterization in the book. It is very clear for me that he needs to come down from his very stratospheric levels of how he wants to, or think he wants to, to run the world and run the situation after the peace. He basically has to get his hands dirty and do compromises. And you also not only have to do compromises when you want to move things, you have to love them. You have to love your compromises. And you have to force others that are part of the compromise to love them and stand by them as well. As I see the, the economic and political debate 
see it around the world, and I share many of the, the, the worries that has been expressed already here. I think there are a bit too many what I call ideological Puritans out there who are uh, on either side, and they say they don't get the optimized version of what they would like to see. It's, it's useless. It's the scorching of the middle ground here that I, I think is, is very worrying. And I, I can also notice that the pundits that we all know of, central bank pundits, political pundits, are going in the same direction. It's, it's scorching the middle ground and, uh, and it, not many who are, are standing in favor of compromises. I know compromises are great, but uh, it's certainly something that, that needs to be loved with great passion. Which takes me to the UK Premiership, Lloyd George, which very spectacularly, I think, managed to minimise his room to manoeuvre by setting up an election and be overtaken by events and then turn into a, a very populistic short-term view. I think being a politician is about, to the best of your ability, define what room you have to manoeuvre and, and keep that room to manoeuvre because there will, will always be, again, pundits and and ideological Puritans who all try to rein you in, to try to take over the narrative. And as a, as a political leader, you have to be more leader than actual political. Find the narrative and stick to it, maintain the room to move over. And he very spectacularly gave all that away. So that is a stunningly bad example of, of the performance in a development dialogue that we had with him. Uh, which takes me to Clemenceau. And Clemenceau is active in doing something that we, we nowadays recognize, fortunately on Twitter, is trying to bully your opponent into submission, which never works, which never works. He's very much a guy who maintains the view that the world is a zero-sum game, which we know is wrong, especially when it comes to economics. And he's completely lost the plot that if I help you, you can help me back, and we will both be at a rock. Now, in a way, I understand that they were all stuck in a very difficult situation. They had to move things in a very different corner uh, situation. And it takes a lot of guts to do that. And here, to just move over a little bit to our contemporary issues, I think how you see the world determines your actions. And I think we are in a pretty bad place now, where we are, 2019. There is a lot of anxiety, there is a lot of downside risks. I don't want to come out as complacent, but I would like to stress that there is a lot of knowledge, there is a lot of experience. We're standing on the shoulders of these people who have been here before us and made a number of mistakes. We also know that there are a number of tools to use. And I take inspiration from what Keynes wrote about, so I'm in central banking, the importance of maintaining stable and low inflation. Uh, he expresses very elegantly about the risks of some groups of society being hurt very badly by, from inflation, others are being protected. And we can see how that sort of resonates today, but with technological changes. Having stable and low uh, inflation is a sort of one of these foundations that we can provide so that people can, can go on and, and handle other kinds of risks as they, they move on in the ex especially the organizers, both the organizers and organizers and the people who put it on, uh, doing all the work behind the scenes. I really appreciate it. I've learned a ton today. Uh, much of the discussion touched on issues that, with which I'm largely unfamiliar. I learned a lot about the history of the 1930s that I didn't know the details. But I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, my reflections today are spurred largely by the work that I've done that focused mostly on the general theory. Uh, and I think it's very easy perhaps for you, but certainly for me, to because I look at Keynes' work as a whole from a sort of backwards perspective, it tends to lay out like a solar system for me with the general theory as the sun. And I, I tend to understand all of the other things as I read them through how I understand the general theory, which is not, of course, I know the right way to go about things, and it's not how we think, and it's not how we write or live. Um, so this was a very interesting exercise for me to return to an earlier piece of work and try to restrain myself from seeing in it always the seeds of the general theory, but also to see the connections across them. And the, the most important connection across 
the, those almost 20 years, let's say, for me, is the, and I get this from almost everything I read from Keynes, is a sort of intimidating, hopeful combination of, of a kind of constant fear of disaster, but also some hope. They, they seem to live beside each other in his work. And so he, all of his work is filled with actually quite dire predictions sometimes. You know, men will not, or I haven't written down here, men will not always die quietly. The revolution is <coughs> just beyond the borders of, of reason. We, there, in some ways, I think if Keynes was alive today, he would say there's a reason we call the central <coughs> bank the, the lender of last resort, because once we get past the last resort, the whole social order breaks down. Um, and there's this sense of foreboding, I think, that resonates throughout this entire book. And I ask myself, OK, so what is he afraid of? What is, it, what is, what, what, what is, what is the or else that looms over so much of, of this story? Um, and as you may know, or some of you probably are familiar with this literature, there's actually a long line of, of uh, left criticism of Keynes that understands, for the most part, it began actually just after the general theory was published in the 1930s. And much of it understood itself as having been recognized by Keynes. So the general theory emerged as a response to socialism, as a response to working class activism. And, and, and many people claim that, that Keynes was proof that the working class was breaking the surface of history and becoming an autonomous force. This is a very common critique in, in Western Marxism. I think that that's a misreading, a very, a very self-absorbed, let's say, misreading of what Keynes was actually afraid of. So I, I wanted to ask myself, what is he afraid of? What has he come to save? And what, what did he want to save it from? And to me, I think that if you the theme that runs through everything that he wrote, but certainly it's already there in the economic consequences, is it's, it's civilization itself that's at risk. It's the social order itself. And insofar as that's the case, if he asks himself what he's afraid of, I think he, he, he looks at history. He looks, he looks as far back, perhaps, as the French Revolution, but certainly he looks at Russia at the moment, and he sees what he fears, a kind of breakdown of the social order, a rabble that is subject to demagoguery and the rise of forces of reaction and revolution, as he mentions, in the economic consequences themselves. I think, to be honest with you, that the most fundamental way in which this book matters today is that it resonates with, I hope I'm not saying this just for myself, it resonates with my own sense of a very similar existential precarity at this moment. The book speaks to me, and I think probably many of you, but I shouldn't say for anyone else, of a, a kind of moment of, of, of anxiety with which the clarity of previous answers are, is, is no longer sufficient for the moment. Civilization for, for, for Keynes, actually, is, of course, just like what a lot of people identified today earlier in his discussion of the, of the piece itself. It's a fragile, complex, delicate mechanism. In fact, later on, he wrote of his, his early beliefs in the 1930s, you may know this. He says, civilization itself is a thin crust maintained only by the guile of very few who understand what's actually at risk. And I cannot help but feel sympathy with that somewhat elitist perspective. But I, I, I think that it's the relevance of this book reaches through me, reaches to me at, at, in, in precisely this manner. And I think that uh, Stan mentioned it earlier, but I think if Keynes were around today, he would say that what he feared is coming true. The rise of populisms, the rise of nationalisms, the rise of demagogues, the rise of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an instability and a precarity that, that makes his ideas actually have an extraordinarily broad appeal across groups of people that I think would not normally understand themselves as having sympathy. <laughs> One of the most challenging things about this, though, and maybe perhaps we reach the limits of what Keynes can provide us with right now, is that with facing something like the, like the climate crisis, a politics of deferral is no longer possible. There is no possibility of staving off the crisis in the hope that something will, that better will come along unless you believe that we can do carbon capture and storage at the scale that is now physically impossible. So we, we've reached a point where, to some extent, the, the peace-like stability that might find its analog in the climate condition is no longer there. And insofar as that's the case, the politics of deferral, the politics of placation, perhaps, that Keynes sometimes suggests is no longer at hand. And the answer, then, is, is unknown. Because 
because it comes to seem as if the radical option is the only option. And insofar as that's the case, it doesn't fit how I understand things to look at the world. But I cannot help but read the book and have my own anxiety stirred again, uh, which happens actually in virtually everything he's written. Anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you. So, trying to pull together those four fascinating prompts, as it were, for further discussion, it seems to me that we have the first two, really, I could be summarised, I think, as guess, is the spilling out of pains of concern about transition. We formulated it in distinct ways. Edward was referring to, to Gramsci. Stanley was referring to the Thucydides problem, or a great power problem, Gramsci's notion of a of an order in transition giving rise to more than symptoms. Then, Cecilia picked out for us, I guess, a theme which has preoccupied several people in the course of today's discussions, which is Keynes' incredibly fascinating, perhaps misleading in historical terms, but nevertheless instructive commentary, one might even say a kind of bestiary of malfunctions, of, of action, which is key to his conception of how order is achieved. It's achieved through action, but then also from action can clearly issue disorder as a result of the vices which you so nicely uh, highlighted for Cecilia. Cecilia the, the, the inability to love compromise, the necessity of it, the inability to love it, the, the, the self-obstruction of a politician looking for support and thereby foreclosing room for manoeuvre, and then the bullying zero-sum and logic. All of these pathologies, if you like, of action. What can I think multiply, but, but that will do the trick. And then another common theme which came out more and more loudly in both your comments is really the, the, the deep conservatism fundamentally. If we think of Keynes of the general theory as, a, as the radical, the man, the iconoclast, the man who remakes economics, what's so striking about the economic consequences of the piece, even down to its economics, it is, is, is their conservatism. With, with the famous line about inflation, which as we were hearing earlier on today was subsequently revised as Keynes moves towards a more liberal position on, on money. We also discovered earlier today about his vested interest in the conservative <laughs> monetary policy. And then exactly what I was hoping for from Jeff, namely both a deep resonance with that Edwardian sense of anxiety, but then the basic question of whether our problems are not even worse, in the sense that, you know, it may be vastly over-optimistic, but in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> Some people are going to die quite soon. Already are. Uh, already are in the Bahamas. And that, that basic illogic, that basic inconsistency in Keynesian economics, which consists precisely in dissociating the short run from the long run and refusing the idea that a series of short runs consistently add up to some general, general equilibrium which exists outside time, right? and insisting instead on the need for a fix now. That that, that that mode of deferral, that inconsistency, will not wash, it will not cope with a problem which does need a radical solution that is consistent. And then that just leaves us with a series of climate negotiations. So those seem to me to be really four very promising routes for further explanation. I'd open up the floor at this point before we go back to the panel perhaps for, for insights, for questions, for suggestions from your side. James, I'm going to make a list. I'm going to, I'll work my way through it bit by bit. James. Yeah, thank you all for very stimulating comments. Uh, I would say as pessimistic as these comments have been, particularly Stanley's, I, I actually fear that things are even worse than that. And I say that on, on the basis of the economic consequences. So. You're right, we have the Thucydides trap. China can't credibly commit to not renegotiate the order down the road. That incentivizes the US to bring what it perceives as an inevitable conflict forward. We also have, as Keynes noted throughout his career, the economic manifestations of this, global economic imbalances, the asymmetric burdens this creates. That is essentially Trumpism, right? China, you adjust. China says, no, America, you adjust. But as I say, I think the economic consequences of the peace suggest things are, are far worse because of the mentality that we now have. And that's the first sentence of the book, the power to become habituated to his surroundings is a marked characteristic of mankind. We, as in 1914, have become so used to the remarkable success of the post-war order that we become enormously reckless 
And Trump, again, is a manifestation of this. Boris Johnson is a manifestation of this. We assume that things can only get so bad. We don't realize that we still have the same old problems. We have these new problems of climate change. We haven't resolved them, and yet we are acting as actors were in 1914, assuming that the system is totally durable and disaster-proof when it's obviously not. I'm going to bring uh, David Johnson in, and then it is. Okay. I wanted to pick up on something Cecilia said about Lloyd George, and that he boxed himself in by holding an election. I said it's partly because tonight there's a vote in the House of Commons about when to have an election, which may turn out to be an extremely consequential event. And I think Keynes, my understanding of Keynes shared that view, so when you read Keynes, I always found a consistent theme was his horror of elections. Uh, he thought democracy would go so much better without elections. <laughs> um, or at least that they always came at the wrong time. The trouble with elections is they would be really good if it happened when they happened. But there's never a good time to hold them. So yes, Lloyd George was boxed in by his election. And I think Keynes' horror of elections came from his memory of 1918. The horror of the 1918 election stayed with him all his life. But Wilson had his election in the midterms uh, in November 1918. And the problem with them, people always said, was they came too soon because the war was still going on, just. Only the war had finished, people could have taken stock, but they were still voting in the throes of the conflict. So Lloyd George so Wilson lost those elections. He got the Congress that then boxed him in. Lloyd George held his elections after the war. That was the wrong time, because then people were vindictive and punitive. And then in France, they delayed their elections until after the conference. And that didn't work either, because Clemenceau had tried to rise above it. And the French elected a far right, a mass far right. There's never a good time to hold elections. And I just feel that there's a kind of echo of that now. Uh, so we lived through a century where people's faith in democracy was partly a faith in elections. And now I'm not sure we have that faith so much. And there is some kind of connection there. I mean, I don't think you can take the Keynesian view that democracy would go better without elections. But there is an increasing view that democracy needs a lot more than elections, including around issues like climate. And that that may be a link across the century over the intervening period where there are particularly had been times where people have just thought, well, wait for the next election, and that will sort of doubt. I think that, that faith is going. But also, there is never a good time to hold an election, and I think the vote in Parliament tonight is going to reflect that. Edward, you Just a, a couple of comments. On, first of all, on, on the first speaker, what, what strikes me is the similarity when there is, um, it's increasingly, there's no obvious leader, un unlike in, in 1945 and during the Cold War when the US was a clear leader. And, What's particularly troubling to me is that rather than use the multilateral trading system as a way of persuading <coughs> China to come in and change its behavior, the US is actually you know, kicking everyone else, kicking sand in everyone else's eyes and going it alone. And the same thing is true to a slightly lesser extent. It's also true in security. You, know, you don't see um, a sense of the US using its alliances, which are priceless, frankly, in order to reinforce the system, you see the US weakening, potentially weakening the system. And that's why Trump is a morbid symptom, in my view. On, on, on elections, yes, I mean, it is, it is so interesting how, you know, we looked at Hungary recently, and how Hungary has used precisely all the furniture of, of democracy, <coughs> and it, it sets turn of Hungary into a one-party state. And, and I, think it's, I think it's not just a perception, I think it's true that elections are not enough. And we see in this country, from week to week how each encroachment on the institutions by one side justifies the encroachment by the other side. And I don't know how one gets out of that sort of arms race in institutions. I mean, you did a fantastic radio series on, on democracy, and I'm very interested to know kind of how you think you get out of this, this sort of terrible spiral downwards. Uh, you know, the, the model of democracy is a pendulum between, between the two sides, seems to me not the right metaphor anymore. The metaphor is now sort of how to skelter as each side you know, you know, that builds on the abuses of the, of the last. And it connects to the zero sum. Yeah, that's right. I'm just going to bring in the leaves and then we'll talk about anything. Yeah. Yeah. A remark and a question to Jonathan, but just before, I think you were so pessimistic, and I'm afraid that maybe my way of presenting the balance of power versus hegemony had some sort of, I, I started to be pessimistic in the morning, but <laughs> so, so I feel that I should now cheer you up, and that's what I'm, I'm going to try to do. But 
for the people who do not understand, I, I'm really sure this morning that Trump is an endogenous outcome, and it's not something that is coming as exogenous. But I want now to ask you a question and start first from your quote, because in my paper, I quote it. It is from the new statement of Keynes. And he says, and look at this, the end, because you didn't go to the end. You start with, I've said in another sort of context that in the long run, we are all dead. But I could have said equally well that in the short run, we are still alive. Life and history are made up of short run. And how does it finish? Britain should build up its naval strengths and wait for the dictators to make mistakes. So the end is about fighting. And if the end is about fighting, I would like now to ask a question. You speak about the climate, cl climate change. Don't you see that if case would be today here, he wouldn't speak about the very small question of CO2, but going to the real problem, which is the population increase in our world. I, I'll just interject, using the privilege of the chair very briefly, that the one electorate that, that David didn't mention was the German electorate, who, in a sense, make the avoidance of the Turkish option, uh, which we were talking about earlier today, possible. In a sense, that they elect, by a huge majority, a group of politicians who are actually willing to sign the peace. Because, not because they're traitors, but because they judge that a scenario of armed resistance to the Allies will be a complete disaster for Germany. That down that path lurks the terror, which is the Russian question, which is not Stalinism, not T-34s rolling eastwards, but anarchy, mass starvation, and disaster. And uh, politicians from both the German SPD, from the forerunner of uh, Angela Merkel's CDU, steel themselves to sign this treaty because they judge that that is in the best interest of, of holding Germany together. And it's an incredibly fine balance. Which Richard earlier on today was playing through the counterfactual of a monarchist government, Germany being forced to sign the treaty, and this would have been better. It could also very equally have produced civil war. So the democracy at this moment, also on the side of Germany, demonstrates considerable resilience in the face of absolutely massive, massive stress. The fact is too easily ignored. Right here in the, in the orange dress, and then I've got Harold James. Here comes the compromise of, of my love, or that I love. Um, so bear with me, I'm going to take you to Sweden in the 1990s. But in the early 1990s, we had a considerable uh, economic financial crisis. I think Rover Reinhardt, who calls it one of the big four or big five, uh, a great shock to the establishment of the political system. Now, what happened in the, in the years following that? First of all, we had help from the global recovery. I, I, I like to admit that. But, Something else was also happening in the Swedish society which I found very inspiring, which was that all the mainstream parties were agreement that they didn't want to end up in a similar situation again. So the, the direction was very clear, that there was a need for budget consolidation. That was independent on which party really people voted for. But if you voted for a conservative party, you would get more spending cuts. And if you voted more to the left, you would get tax hikes. But it was possible for the electorate to sort of express their preferences on how they wanted to get them, themselves <coughs> out of the situation. And in combination with, with the budget consolidation, a number of structural reforms was also taking place. The central banking reform, the wage formation reform, public finance, the budget process reform. So I think it's an example of where the establishment actually, although they might be very much in disagreement what's the problem and the way out, there was an agreement that you wanted forward and it was up to the electorate then to express the preferences on how that movement was made forward. While I got the talking stick, I'd like to make a recommendation, one more actually. Sweden and Norway got divided in 1905 and as far as I remember my history knowledge, not a single shot fired in that that divorce. So um, you know, it's possible. That's all I'd like to say. I'm going to seize that opportunity to call things to a close. But before we head out, can I just ask you to thank our fabulous panel for really